Welcome, dear learners. Now we will be discussing literary criticism and literary theory. So this presentation is going to be a short introduction to literary criticism and literary theories. Literary criticism is the study, evaluation, and interpretation of literature. It is based on literary theory, which is the philosophical discussion of literature's goals and methods. The word criticism derives from the Greek word kritikos, which means judgment. It is the analysis and exposition of works of art by means of written word. When we see classical criticism, we discuss Plato, Aristotle, and other important works. Plato's Republic is an attack on poetry. He considered art as third removed from the truth or reality. Aristotle's Poetics is another masterpiece of criticism where in fourth century, he has explained in detail the rules of writing a drama. He talks about mimesis, which is imitation, Catharsis, which is purgation of emotions, hamartia, tragic flaw, and agnorisis, recognition, and peripetia, which is reversal of fortune. He also talks about three unities where the plot of a story should have all the three unities, that is unity of time, unity of place, and unity of action. When we discuss Bharata Muni, he has written Natya Shastra in Sanskrit, which comprises of Indian literature and Sanskrit drama. Longinus is an important work on the sublime. It talks about how a sublime work, a high work, transports a reader outside himself to a different world of ecstasy. Horace Ars Poetica talks about how poetry has, on poets have the responsibility should, to combine both fancy as well as the truth. We next move to Renaissance criticism. Here we have the important writers like Philip Sidney and Francis Bacon. Philip Sidney's important critical piece is Apology for Poetry, and Francis Bacon has written The Advancement of Learning. In Apology for Poetry, Sidney discusses poet's superiority to the philosopher and the historian on the grounds that the poet's imagination is chained neither to lifeless abstractions like philosophy, not to dull actualities or chronology like historian. Francis Bacon talks about or he aligns the psychology of the inner senses with tripartite division of knowledge, poesy springing from the imagination, history from memory, and philosophy from reason. When we move to Age of Enlightenment, that is Age of Reason, in 17th to 19th century, the most important phrase of the criticism is Rene Descartes' cogito egosum, which means I think, therefore I am. And we also have John Dryden, whose important critical piece includes an essay of dramatic poesy. Here, he attempts to justify drama as a legitimate form of poetry comparable to the epic as well as he defends English drama against that of the ancients and the French. Pope has written an essay on criticism. Those are the first major poems where he has talked about human life and it is a source of famous quotations like to err is human, to forgive divine, a little learning is a dangerous thing and fools rush in where angels fear to tread. We also have coffee houses, especially in the age of Queen Anne, which became the meeting points of business discussions as well as literary reviews. Mary Wollstonecraft, the feminist, has written a vindication on the rights of women, which is an important work of criticism in this era. Romantic criticism. Romantic critics introduced new aesthetic ideas to literary studies, including that the object of literature need not always be beautiful, noble, or perfect, but even a common thing could elevate the subject of poetry to the sublime level. Wordsworth's important criticism include prefaced lyrical ballads, where he discusses 
ordinary life is the best subject for poetry. Everyday language is best suited for poetry. And expression of feeling is more important than action or plot. Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of emotion that takes its origin from emotion, recollected in tranquility. Coleridge has written Biographia Literaria, where he has discussed important terms like imagination and fancy, where he talks about original creation and the logical way of organizing sensory things. And he also talks about suspension of disbelief, a category or a common element of fiction where the readers willingly suspend their beliefs of reality and they enter into the world of fiction. Next, we will be seeing important theories of literary criticism. First comes archetypal criticism. It is a type of analytical theory that interprets a text by focusing on recurring myths or an archetype where the word archi is derived from the Greek term, which means beginning and, uh, and typos is imprint. We often find these kind of archetypes or recurring patterns in the narrative. It can be symbols, it can be images or even character types in literary works. Structuralism deals with the scientific process of identifying and analyzing the codes, the forms, the signs, and the systems, and even the symbols, which are embedded in social and cultural practices. Post-structuralism is the idea that the literary text has a single meaning or purpose, and this single purpose was denied by the post-structuralist. They believe rather every individual creates their own meaning of the text, hence a text has multiple meanings. For them, the meaning finds attention in its reader's reception of it than what the author intends. Deconstruction, it involves the close reading of text in order to demonstrate that any given text has irreconcilably contradictory meanings rather than being a unified logical whole. Feminism can be seen as a movement which put an end to sexism or sexist exploitation and oppression, and they desired to achieve uh, full gender equality in law as well as in practice. Gynocriticism, it is a study of women's writing, and this term gynocriticism was coined by Ellen Schwalter in 1979 to refer to a form of feminist literary criticism that is concerned with women as writers. Formalism is a school of literary criticism and literary theory having mainly to do with structural purposes of a particular text and it is the study of a text without taking into account any outside influence. Reader response theory recognizes the reader as an active agent who imparts real existence to the work and completes its meaning through interpretation. Hermeneutics is the theory and the methodology of interpretation, especially the interpretation of biblical texts, wisdom literature, as well as philosophical text. It includes the art of understanding and communication. Marxism is that works of literature that are mere products of history that can be analyzed by looking at the social and the material conditions in which they were constructed. Next, we move to modernism. It seeks to find new forms of expression and rejects traditional or accepted ideas. It focuses on individualism, experimentation, symbolism, absurdity, and even formalism. Postmodernism, it is a form of literature that is characterized by the use of metafiction, unreliable narration, self-reflexivity, and intertextuality, and which often thematizes both historical and political issues. New historicism, the themes and meaning of literature are not universal and cannot be derived from the text alone. Rather, they are the products of author's time and cultural situation. Psychoanalytic criticism adopts the methods of reading employed by Sigmund Freud and later theorists to interpret text. 
It argues that literary texts like dreams express the secret unconscious desires and the anxieties of the author that a literary work is a manifestation of the author's own neurosis. Ecofeminism is a branch of feminism that examines the connections between women and nature, and its name for name was coined by the French feminist Francois Dubon in 1974. Magic realism, it often refers to literature in particular with magical and supernatural phenomena presented in an ordinary setting commonly found in novels and dramatic performances. And thus today, we had a short introduction to literary criticism as well as the literary theories. Thank you.